In Hollywood, she was considered the next Grace Kelly, but the allure of the silver screen wasn't enough to keep her name on the marquee and her career in the spotlight. We'll find out why tonight on EWTN Live, so please stay with us. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and here we are at EWTN Live, which is our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. Before we get to tonight's guest, I want to mention that today is a great feast of St. Augustine of Hippo. He was, Hippo was a town in North Africa, and he was born there in 354. Oh, excuse me, he was born in Thagasti, but then uh, he went over to Carthage, studied there, became a professor in Rome, and uh, worked in the imperial court, and had tried a cult he had uh, the, called the Manichaeans. He had a, a woman that he lived with as his concubine for 14 years. They had a son until he sort of just dismissed her uh, as socially, uh, you know, less than what he should wanted to be. And Finally, he came to meet Christ. He turned away from his materialist point of view and from the cult that he joined and came to the Catholic faith. After many years of his mother praying for him to do just that. And so he then turned to become a great, as a matter of fact, some would say uh, the greatest of the fathers for sure, and one of the two greatest theologians in the history of the church, along with St. Thomas Aquinas. So we celebrate him and pray for all those folks we know who may have come from a Catholic home but have strayed from the faith, that they might find the satisfaction and the intellectual integrity that St. Augustine is able to provide. Now, our guest tonight, won over Hollywood studio executives, and she angered teenage girls across the country when she gave Elvis Presley his first screen kiss in 1957. Now, Paramount Studios' film Loving You is where she did that. And then she went on to strengthen her standing in Hollywood as a big screen uh, star, acting alongside George Hamilton in the 1960 MGM hit, Where the Boys Are, and followed up that success with a Tony Award and Golden Globe nominations for her work on stage and in the screen. But in 1963, she left the glamour of Hollywood to follow God's casting call for her to live as a cloistered nun, a Benedictine nun in Bethlehem, Connecticut. So, please welcome our guest, Mother Dolores Hart. Thank you very much. Welcome. It's beautiful. Thank you. Welcome. Good to have you here again. It's been a few years since you've been on our program. Yes, indeed. Oh, you came here before with some of your sisters. Mm -hmm. But um, apparently you've been pretty busy since then writing a book well, called The Ear of the Heart. Well, this was with my very good friend Dick Denute, mm -hmm. whom I knew ever since I was in Hollywood. Uh -huh. And Dick said to me, um, and I must have been 2003, you know, we better write your memoir before you get too old to remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I well, thought, that's good. You, you always have to have a friend who shoots straight. Yep. Well, you know, it, it always seems to me that writing a memoir or autobiography is um, something like baby bear's porridge. You don't want to do it too early 
because you don't know where your life is going yet. You don't want to do it too late because you don't want to forget where your life has gone. <laughs> Very good <laughs> So you've analogy. done it just, just right. right. Now, what is, uh, of course, everybody wants to know uh, a couple things. How did you get into film in the first place? Well, it was a long story because, you see, I lived in California and had wanted to be an actress since I was very little because my daddy went off to Hollywood and was found by a screen, um, I guess they call him a, 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 a scout. A scout, yes. Yeah. And he thought he looked a lot like uh, Clark Gable which he did. Mm -hmm. And so he and my mom and he went to California when I was just a baby. I stayed with my grandparents until um, I was about 11 years old and then rejoined my mother in California. But all the while, I had it in my mind, I want to do that. My yeah. grandfather was a projectionist Is in that the right? movie theater. And I used to go with him on the weekends. He would sleep and every time the wheel would come to a certain point, I had to go wake him up. <laughs> and and I, got, I got a nickel of a, 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 a disc. So uh, that, it was... And that's a, when a nickel was worth a nickel. That's when it was worth it. If not more. <laughs> and so, so you, you had this desire, and you got to Hollywood. What opened the doors for you? To we had done, get into movies. I had done a, uh, a part of St. Joan to get my scholarship for college and then found out that Loyola University was doing this play. So my boyfriend, Don Barbo, took a picture of me, a wildly funny picture, and he said, I'm going to send it around to all the movie people, which he did. And within a couple weeks, we got a phone call back from Paul Nathan, at Paramount Films, uh -huh. and Paul was the assistant associate producer for Hal Wallace. So they wanted me to come and try out, I guess to do a screen test for a film they were doing. Well, I was flabbergasted, believe me, and more so when they took the screen test and they called me again and said, you've got the part. So this is, you know, it's just trying to get yourself out there. Right. And you're able to do that. <clears throat> and what was the first film? Well, that was the thing that really was the winner because I met the people in it. Liz Scott was a real movie star. Wendell Corey. <laughs> and then they introduced me to this young man and whom I greeted. And he said, how do you do, Miss Dolores? He said, my name is Elvis Presley. And I said, well, what do you do? <laughs> you honestly, didn't know about him. Honestly, honestly, I, I was so wrapped up in myself, you know, you, kids are, and what I wanted, and, and uh, I guess the, the songs just weren't up my alley at that point. Sure, sure. But it was, he just laughed. I thought he would fall over. He was, he thought that was the funniest thing. And I think it was good because it got us off to a very vulnerable start together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then they said the first day's shooting would be in a certain amount of days, but it would be the last scene in the picture, which I discovered that Hollywood do, does that very right. often. Yeah, they, they don't do it in the order of the film. They do no. it when they feel like doing it, and well, it's convenient. Yeah, and this was the last, this was the big kiss. Mm -hmm. So Hal Cantor gave us a description of how to do it, you know, so you keep your, your, your eyes from making the shadows on one another's face and so on. And he said, and I will say, roll them and cut when it's finished. So he says, roll them, and we go into the clinch. And suddenly, within three seconds, he says, cut. And I thought, what could I have done wrong in that three minute or three seconds? But he came over and he said, Wally Westmore, that was the makeup man, would you please come over and put something on her ears? They're turning red. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that scene that you know, became famous as Elvis's first 
on-screen kiss um, was the first scene you did with him. That's right. And was it all downhill from there? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was great fun because it gave me the opportunity to discover what a great talent he had. Yeah. I went to every, every shot where he was singing just to hear him. Even if I wasn't in the shot, I wanted to be there on stage. And um, I found out he was as good as they said. Yeah. Well, he, uh, you and he were also in another film together, King Creole? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Two years later, the, this time I was signed by Mr. Wallace to a seven-year contract. And uh, this film took us down to... Um, Alaska, uh, no, um, Louisiana. Louisiana, right? And um, all of the streets were jammed with kids. Everybody in New Orleans was out to get a glimpse of him. You couldn't drive to where you wanted to go. So they had to build, um, I guess, ramps from one building to the next for us to get to our job. But meanwhile, we would go to a hotel room and wait. Inevitably, Elvis would go over and pick out the Gideon Bible and open it up some place that he'd probably, anywhere in the Bible, and he would say, this is what it says, and he would read it mm -hmm. and then talk about it. And then the next time, he would give the book to me and say, you open it. And I, I was amazed by that because I thought, this is a boy who has had a good mother who's taught him the values of his Christian life. Yeah, yeah. And I was right, because he, when you hear him sing the gospel songs. Oh, oh they, you get whole albums yeah. of his gospel music mm. that are uh, still, uh, I see them advertised on television because he really put his heart and soul into yes. those gospel hymns. Now, this, you know, and you, you went on to do other movies and such. Um, you know, Where the Boys Are was a big hit. Mm -hmm. uh, you did some uh, Broadway plays, and that was, that was you did well there. Uh, what, there, there's, there's a couple steps, because you were not at this time a practicing Catholic or anything, were you? Oh, yes. Oh, you were, I okay. Was. Actually, I was, uh, started to be a Catholic when I was with my grandmother at uh, age nine, and she sent me to a Catholic school uh -huh. because the Protestant school was across the, the, tr the railroad tracks. And so she, she said, well, they'll teach you well there. And I noticed that the kids didn't go to, to mass the same way I did. They had to fast from midnight. And then they uh, did something at mass. And after mass, they had sweet rolls and chocolate milk. So I said to the teacher, do you think I could have some bread with the children? And she said, what did you say? And she went to the priest and said, I think little Dolores would like to be a Catholic. She wants the Eucharist. So she, he said, if she takes catechism lessons, fine. So I went back to Granny and said, you know, I can have chocolate milk and sweet rolls if I take <laughs> catechism class. <laughs> <laughs> Did your grandmother accept that incentive? She said, you're old enough to do what you want. I don't understand it, but you go ahead. All right. So, so you started taking catechism. This is kind of your own initiative. Right. Definitely a chocolate milk and rolls uh, initiative, but right. a step. It was a step, and I, I mean, our, our Lord certainly got the crowd over with loaves and fish. I'll take the <laughs> chocolate milk any day. Well, I, that's a very good analogy because He uses everything and anything yep. if He can get to our heart or our taste buds. Yep. And so then you, you became a Catholic, and you, so you were living your Catholic faith in this Hollywood and Broadway scene. Is that right? Right. And it was, um, it, it had its moments of, of tension. And um, the, um, but for the most part, I would say that the people that I worked with in Hollywood were very good to me and very respectful yes. of my, my values. Yeah. I, I, 
had, uh, I had a very, very good friend, Maria Janice Cooper, and she was Gary Cooper's daughter. Oh, yeah, sure, I remember Gary Cooper. Uh, Gary Cooper was a star when he was a little boy with the Little Rascals. Yeah, that's right. He was the only That's other my level of comprehension. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was the only other person who, who ever said Miss Dolores until I got to the monastery, uh -huh. and everybody had to be Miss somebody yes. when they came in. But going back to Maria, she was a great help to me and uh, kind of kept me on the straight and narrow in Hollywood and told me where I could go and where I shouldn't go. And in fact, we even got a picture of Maria Cooper and Patricia Neal up there for the folks to see. Oh, yes. And, and so these folks helped you in your Catholic life, but, you know, if, if you've got your Catholic life going and basic support and respect, um, what led you to the convent? Well, when I did the play in New York, I was there about eight months and getting very tired. And I didn't have enough money or contacts to have a place to go or you know, a place in the country. So a friend of mine said, I know this place in Connecticut where you could go and have a wonderful a couple of days when we're dark. And I said, do they have nuns? And she said, well, yes, but they don't talk. They're cloistered. And I said, well, <laughs> all right, I'll give it a try. So I went to Regina Laudas. And Father, I tell you, the minute I put my foot on the ground there, I knew something was of God for me. I knew, I, I just knew this was where I belonged. And I had a chat with Reverend Mother at that time, and she said, well, Dolores, I know how you feel, but I really think you better go back and, and do your Hollywood thing. I think that's where the Lord really wants you now. So you get that out of your system, and when you get a little more mature, we can talk about other ideas. Uh -huh. I was so relieved. <laughs> <laughs> and so how much longer then did you wait before you went, uh, you know, left Hollywood behind and went to the, I, I, did you do more movies? Oh, I did, Father. I, I, that's actually after that I did um, Where the Boys Are. All right, that's with that George was, Hamilton. Right. And then a film called St. Francis of Assisi, and I was asked to play St. Clair. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that was, that was a surprise because um, I didn't feel very saintly in that. But I said, if you'll send me to Assisi, maybe I can go visit her and ask what she could give me. Mm -hmm. And you know. Did you go to Assisi? I did indeed. And going to see St. Clair in her tomb really kept as she, she is all of these years. It was a, it was a very moving sight. Yeah, uh, a lot of folks don't realize, but you know, even though she died in the 13th century, her body has not decayed. No. You know, no. so she's, she's just laid out there and um, you, you see her body. And that's very, it just takes you because you wonder about this mystery of body where Jesus says, after we die, we get our bodies back. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say we give your souls back right. or we give you some spiritual thing back, but your body. Mm -hmm. and. When I saw St. Clair, I said, you know, that's absolutely true because she looks like she's got it back right there. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's certainly more ready than, than I would be. <laughs> now, the, um, so you did this movie on St. Francis, and you played St. Clair. Mm -hmm. uh, any other movies? Well, the next movie, I really think this was the, the one that steered me in the direction because it was I mean, to the community and to the monastic life. It was a film called Lisa with Stephen Boyd about a woman who had been in a concentration camp and used as a medical experiment by the Nazis. And I just, I was so taken. I never realized 
that one nation could take advantage of another to yeah. that extent. Because I, I was young and not really exposed in that way. But and and I, I don't think that in the 1950s, the full impact of what had happened really set in the mindset. That really began to get more clear mm -hmm. in the 60s and people could reflect. Yes. So this, this role had an impact on you. Well, they asked me to meet a young woman who had actually been in Auschwitz, Suzanne Zeda. She was there from the time she was 14 until the war ended. And Suzanne s said something to me that was very important in terms of understanding redemption. Because she said that when the Nazi soldiers came into her house without entering the door or just came barging through, one of them came up to her and she had long black braids which she loved and worked on very, very sure. much. He took the braid in his hand, reached to his belt and took out a knife and just blew, clipped it right off of her and then put the bra braid in her face and said, now you Jew, and made some vulgar remark, is you now belong to me. And she said nothing, nothing really destroyed her sense of femininity and her sense of person as that moment. And I realized that playing Lisa was really a, a way to understand the need for redemption that we have as a corporate people because for persons to be hurt or ruined or taken advantage of by someone else is not the plan of God. No. And no. You, have to, you have to stand against that in whatever way you can. But after that, it really, it really made me wonder, is my work as a movie um, actress, is that sufficient for what I was meant to be or to do? Because I really understood that everyone was different, was unique, was God's own creation. And that... And you know, it's, it's fascinating to me that you come to that conclusion that each person is unique. When you are in a business that you're playing other people. <laughs> And in playing other people, you realize the uniqueness of each and every one. That, 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 that's a fascinating juxtaposition of experiences. You're right on target, Father. Yeah. That was exactly what happened. Yeah. Because um, to play a part or a character was, was always to meet a person that mm -hmm. I had to I had to give them my own body to present who they were and what their purpose was in life. And so as you think about that uniqueness of, the, of each person and you see that not just as a career choice but in the context of God, this brings you back to your vocation. Well. There was a, not a full understanding, believe me, but I had a strong instinctual belief when I met the, the mothers at Regina Laudas that it was through this devoted prayer life, because we, we sing matins, lauds, um, two times a day, sex to known, and then back again at Vespers and Compline, which seems like a lot to people who are not called to that. But it is through that devotion to prayer life and the singing of that together. It, it's that, that communal you know, prayer yes. and dedication to a life of, that's the rhythm of all life in a monastery mm -hmm. is around the hours of the day where you pray. That's right. <coughs> And I think 
the rhythm of getting to know each one and to understand the call of each person, there's, um, th there's a, a tremendous sense of, of community that grows. I, I tell you, it's been a wonderful thing to be on this book tour, but I miss being with my, my family, my community, because singing with them, you can, there's nothing else that meets that. You know, and, and just so folks understand, there was a point at which you had this to decide between a million dollar movie contract or giving up all ownership of money and stuff to go to the convent. That was the choice you had before you. I know, and that was, um, that, that, that was a very, very um, honest decision of our abbess because she said, I know you want to do this, but you take six months now and work this out according to your own place. Don't speak about this to anyone, except I had to tell Don Robinson I was engaged to him. Yeah, and it's good to tell the guy you're yeah. engaged to marry. <laughs> to marry. And um, because it was through his, it, it, it was through it, him that I got to the monastery at that time because we had gone to a party together and he said, Dolores, you were not with us at that party. You're not here. Are you in love with someone else? He said, I think you should go to that monastery and get your mind clear. Yeah. Little did he know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, when I came back and met him and I told him, you've never seen such an angry man. But then, he came down to himself and he said, but you know what? All love relationships don't end at the altar. I promise you, I will be with you all the way through this. I said, Don, you don't, you don't have to say that. And he said, of course I don't, but I will love you. Yeah. What else can I say? Sure. And you know, he never married, but he did stay such a faithful friend. Oh, that's great. Up until he died 18 months ago. Now, now we're, uh, God rest his soul. Um, I just have to uh, ask one question for our audience. Mm. Do you belong to the Benedictine Special Forces Unit? <laughs> I know what you're driving at. <laughs> I know. <laughs> this was given to me many years ago by our abbess when I complained about my head being cold because uh -huh. I had a lot of hair and I wore it up in buns and so on. And she said, I think I have something for you that will help. And she <laughs> gave me the, the cap, but she didn't give me all the jazz. <laughs> okay, there you go. Well, I just want to let people know uh, about your book. It's called The Ear of the Heart. And this is uh, your, your biography. Uh, your memoirs, you did this with um, Richard Denute. And, um, you know, we want to let people know that uh, this book, which is an actress's journey from Hollywood to Holy Vows, you can get this over at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Just go to EWTNReligiousCatalog.com or you can call them 1-800-854-6318. And I think you'll like it. But we have to take a little break. I want to come back because some of you may have a few questions to ask Mother Dolores. So please stay with us.
Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. First of all, before we get to some of these issues, I want to mention that um, if you have a chance to come be part of our live studio audience, we would love to have you. Uh, please contact our pilgrimage department here at EWTN, and they will help you with all sorts of important information. You can call them at 205 271 2966, or you can also go to the website EWTN.com, and they'll give you lots of information about different uh, things and uh, place to stay, scheduling of masses, programs, tours, uh, directions up to Hansville to be able to pray with the sisters, all that be part of it. So we'd love to have you come and join us. Are you ready for some questions? I am, Father, please. Let's start off with a phone call. We have Marianne. Hello, Marianne. Hi, Father Paco. How are you? Fine. Where are you from? I'm from New York. Great. Um, and your question? Um, I have a question for uh, Mother Dolores. Um, I think you're wonderful. I just love your story. And I just have a brief question. You know, for a number of years, I, I've felt a, you know, a calling or an interest in pursuing the religious life. But my main fear has always been if you know, I do pursue that, that I'm going to miss my life on the outside. I'm going to miss the civilian life. And I was hoping if you could share you know, some meditations or prayers or other forms of encouragement that have helped you sustain your vocation um, in the, the pursuit of, of the glory of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I appreciate um, your being on here. And God bless you so much. I thank you for taking my question. Thank you, Mary Ann. And so well, Father, what about that issue of missing the outside world? I think that you have to go back to the fact that a vocation is a call in love. It really comes from that center of yourself where you love the place, you love the people, and you love being there. I think that um, for me in any way, being on the outside is a wonderful gift. But all I wanted to do was get home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I sense the same issue for me in religious life. I, um, I don't want to be out of my order. You know, this is this is where the Lord calls and gives uh, that peace mm -hmm. that lasts. Uh, and you know, said, why would I? want to be someplace else. You know, I, I love doing what I do to serve our Lord, and, and that's a great joy that mm -hmm. if we, I don't even think much about what it'd be like out there. So let's... We, we have a do. lot of guests who come frequently to the monastery, and you hear the suffering and the concern, the difficulties, so it's, it's not like you're missing much. You're, yeah gratefully not having to take much. Yeah, yeah no, no, I think, I think that um, yeah, it's, you know, being married, being in the world has real struggles of its own. It's hard. And we've got struggles in religious life, yes. but it's just a matter of which problems our Lord thinks you'll do best at dealing with. That's great. Not to mention which <laughs> troubles you'll do best at causing. <laughs> we have a question from our studio. Ma'am, where are you from? I am from right here in Birmingham now, Father. Good to have you here and your question. My question is, I, I heard another program where you mentioned you were still a part of the motion picture actress, or actors um, group, anyway, that votes. Yeah, it's, a, it's the motion, the Academy motion. of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Arts and yeah. Sciences, thank you. And. Um, so you still vote on um, the movies, and you still do you get them in the convent? How do you do that? Do you select what you want to see, or? Well, I began to be a member of the Motion Picture Academy in 1960, after Where the Boys Are, and um, an actor has to have your your um, I think you have to have your name above the title before you can ask. At least in those years, you did. Yes. And when I entered the monastery, Mother Abbas said, I, I don't think you have to be an active member anymore. Can you just be like a, a holding member? Well, I said, fine, 
I'll accept that, I have to. But in 1992, I think, on my 25th anniversary, Carl Malden was the president of oh, the yeah, Academy. Sure. And Carl called me and said, do you think they can trust you now? Have you been there long enough <laughs> <laughs> that you could start doing an active voting again? And Mother said, please, go ahead. And, what the, and I said, Carl, I don't know what to do. Well, he sent me uh, um, uh, a beautiful, it, it's not the same thing we have now. It was an early form where you put in a disc and, the, and you have a, 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 a photograph on the screen that comes with it. So I have that down in my office. And my bird and I, I have a wonderful parrot who loves the movies. And we, we watch just whatever comes. If it comes to the point where you know it's just really not going to make it, you don't waste your time on it. Right. But you kind of know what holds you. Like Les Miserables, I was right there every free moment I had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, some movies are really important. As a matter of fact, you went to the Oscars yourself recently. What was that, last year or this year? That was in 2012, I think. 2012. And the reason is they did a documentary about you. Um, H uh, HBO Network did Hugh that. Hugh Evans, that's right. Yeah, it was called God is Bigger Than Elvis. Well, <laughs> Elvis knew that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was God is the Bigger Elvis. Oh. So it went the other way around. Uh -huh. Elvis got the Got, got the, uh, what do you call it? The well, that sounds like HBO. <laughs> but at any rate, you know, but Elvis knew that God was bigger than he, that's for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. And uh, he did not want to be called the king. No, no, Not no. at all. Yeah. But, um, so you went over there. I, I saw a, a, a shot of you uh, on uh, our news. I didn't, I don't watch the Oscars. Um, but uh, you know they, they had a shot of you. Uh, you weren't dressed like everybody else. No, in fact, I had my my own habit, and I had our uh, cowl that we wear for for our um, vespers, which is a beautiful garment that is is quite elegant. And they said, just wear what you have. That's the best looking outfit you can find, and that was for me. But yeah. you know, the funny <laughs> part was. When we got on the, the, the carpet, I thought this was a riot. I mean, just banks and banks of kids screaming and all those photographs. It seemed like going into the ancient uh, the world of the, in the, I guess, in the Colosseum where you, you walked in and were thrown to the lions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But. Here you're um, thrown to the paparazzi. But while we were standing there, this fellow who is now very. Um, known for his antics, came by and threw um, black soot all over the guy that was next to him. And I don't know, in the context of that, they all thought I was dressed up as a gag. Oh. That I wasn't real. Oh. So um, I decided I, I'm not going to argue with anybody about that. Yeah. You know, it's, you know I, I must say, I, I've been very disappointed by some of the things that, that Hollywood does to people, especially to young women. Uh, it seems to be highly problematic. Disney Company seems to just spit them out and you know, chew them up and spit them out. Uh, it's very sad. Let's take another call. We have Mary. Uh, where are you from, Mary? Good evening, Father and Mother Dolores, Fox Christi. I am from Connecticut, a neighbor of Bethlehem. Oh, great. And what's your question? The question, mine is the opposite, but I'm curious of, with uh, after listening so, uh, to you, um, Reverend Mother, how long did it take for your discernment? When I was in reversal of your role, I was going into the convent. My mind was set up. That was the, my direction. But on All Saints Day in All Saints Church, I got the words, you are to marry. And of course, Father Mitch, being a Jesuit, will be very pleased. 
my husband to be at the time uh, that he uh, was. Uh, he thought I thought he was crazy, of course, but he wanted to marry me because I kept saying I'm going into the convent. But I got my answer, and I called from the rectory from where the, my confessor was. And the confessor said, well, you must do what the Holy Spirit is leading you to. So now I'm 63 years married, but dear Reverend Mother, how long did it take you? Because it seemed forever for me. I will hang up, and, and I'd like to ask, is it possible to have a retreat at your house? All right, well, let's deal with those two questions. First of all, congratulations on 63 years of marriage. That's that is a very good start. Now, in terms of how long it took to, um, you know, discern this vocation, how long was that process for you? Well, our altogether? process, and I was pretty classical in my steps, because we are postulant for a year, and then we have um, novitiate for a couple of years, and then we have another, um, uh, it's another part we call commitment, where you are really committed to that elemental that you respond to, the area where you feel you can do something particular and good. I'm one of our sisters who's just committed to the book bindery, and so it's that clear, in, and through the elemental, that is the key, I think, in the monastery to finally beginning to find vows because first vows come then about a year later and then you have a one to nine years to make up your mind for your final vows. I, I, I think that's very important for people to understand. You know, for us, the seminary training takes a number of years. You don't just sort of hook them and grab them and just slap them into work. but. Right. It's a process of discernment by us and by the community. And same thing with Benedictines and the yes, other orders. Yes. It's a process of ongoing listening to God and seeing if that peace lasts those years. And I do think that something in you knows that you're moving in the right direction. Yes. Or even there'll come periods where you just can't face it. You think, no, this isn't right. but you do what you know you must. Yeah. And somehow that carries you through to a final point of stability. And I do think a very important part of this is coming to know and love your community yes. and really saying, I want to be with these people. Yeah. That's, a very, that's not something you can pass off. No. Because no. you don't live with God alone. <laughs> no, 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 no. You've got the community, and that's extremely important. Let's take another call. Hello, Dan? Is Dan there? Hello? I hear him, but <laughs> he's not responding. Hey, Father Mitch. Oh, there you are. Where are you from, Dan? Calling from Connecticut. I'm right. a neighbor of Regina Laudis. Oh, great. That's wonderful. And your question? Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mother Dolores, the Hollywood of the 1950s, her Hollywood, was quite different from the Hollywood of today. I wonder if she could comment about the state of today's motion picture industry. Does she see some hope, hopefully, that there might be a return to more uh, uh, motion pictures with great values in the Judeo-Christian sense? Or does she feel, as so many of us do, that... It's just a lost cause at this particular time. And with that, I'll hang up and listen to her, her answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Well, I think the movies really try to reflect the desire and the heart of the people, or the heartlessness, whatever, which way it goes. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that the movies make up things themselves. I think they always make up something or do something that they think will meet what the people want. So I do think that part of this darkness comes from the fact that we are in another dark age in our faith right now. Yes. And everyone knows 
we're going through something very new and very difficult in coming through to establish a new way of belief because there's so much that fights what we believe in. I, I, I've noticed one little trend um, that I steer clear of, but I see advertised a lot of horror movies, and they're really much more violent than the horror movies of, say, the 30s or 40s. Those are very tame. And I keep thinking, you know, people used to complain about the priests preaching on hell, fire, and damnation. And so the priest stopped. Now, Hollywood presents hell, fire, and damnation, <laughs> and we pay more to see that than we used to do to go to church. Uh, it's, it's a crazy thing. Well, but you know, the thing that always got me was when they stopped praying in the schools. Yes. And that, it wasn't, how many months was it until a guy went into the school with a, with a machine gun? Yep. yep. And I do believe that if we open the door to a certain behavior, it'll happen. Yeah. Let's take another call. We have Joe. Hello, Joe. Hi. How are you doing? Fine. Where like are you to from? Ask Mother Dolores. Um, she, my favorite performance ever was in the, is her in the uh, Where the Boys Are. And I think she should have won an Oscar for it. Uh, <laughs> I, I was wondering if she goes through any regrets and thinking about, oh, gee, should I have done that because I could have won an Oscar? Or is God her biggest Oscar? Well, I tell you, the only real one that hit me was after I did the play, The, the Pleasure of His Company. And Pearl C. Spurberg and Seton came in after the show one night and said, we're so happy to meet you and to give you the news that you will be given the title role in the movie that we're going to make of this show in two months. Well, I was so happy. Well, wouldn't you know, another couple of days went by and Debbie Reynolds knocked on my door, came into the same uh, makeup place and said, you know, Dolores, I was so pleased with your performance tonight. I studied every move you made because I'm doing it on, in Hollywood. Oh. And I thought, how? How can this be? Yeah. But I think that was my first introduction to the, um, the, the matters of, of life and men. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's... It, it's <laughs> You know, a comment like that um, almost uh, uh, almost sounds offensive. Like, um, now that I got the part, I want to do what you do. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you how much I want to do what you do when I get the part. You know, it's, it's all she's yeah, that's bragging true. a little bit. Yeah, but, um, it's, but, but that's one of the downfalls of what you have to live with in that business. Now, I have another caller here. Hello, Mary. Yes, hello, Father. Hi, where are you from? Hello, Mother. Hello, Mary. I'm, I'm, calling, I'm calling from Boston. Great. And your question? Yes. My question is, I know that Mother was engaged as a young woman, and um, I heard that after the engagement um, ended that they remained friends for the rest of um, you know, the rest of his life. And I just wondered how you were able um, to bring it from a romantic love to a beautiful friendship over time? Well, you see, I, I think that there's a romantic love that exists between persons, and it's not that you bring it to a beautiful friendship. You bring it to a transcendent level where you really do believe and know that you meet Christ in the other person. And it's more than a friendship. It's a, it's a, it's a way of communion. and. I, I believe that Don brought to me that reality. It was not that we tried to, it, it happened because we both went into a mode of living in which sacrifice was the, was the order of the day. Yeah. Now, w was he a man of faith? Absolutely, he was a very good Catholic. Uh -huh. In fact, I just talked to his sister 
two days ago who will come and see me in, in the monastery as soon as I get home. Mm -hmm. So they, they had a very, very strong Catholic background. Uh -huh. so, so this was something that, um, you know, he had a, a, a background of faith, a context of faith within which to understand Absolutely. your vocation. Yes, and I, I really think that was, again, when you look back on your life, if you can really, I think, can contemplate it, you see the mode of gift that God gives you so that every part of your life, there's a choreography to it, which is more than just an, uh, uh, an incident mm -hmm. or coincident. It's really a plan of God in which you are meant to fulfill your call. And I think I really could never have done that if I had been engaged to a man who didn't understand my call. Sure, sure. And, you know, one, one of the things I, I certainly can recall in discussions with my father, my, now my father was very against me being a priest or and a Jesuit. But we said, I really don't understand. Are these cloistered orders where all they do is pray? Now, what would you say to someone who comes and they're like, well, why do you just spend your life praying? What, don't you have something better to do with well, your life? They should see we have 400 acres of land and a self-sustaining farm with, um, I think it's how many, 40 uh, cattle. Um, and we have an, a, 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 another um, barn which is for milking. I don't know how many milking cows are up, but it seems to me in the morning enough are, there's always a few that are there doing the milking. Sure. And then they have to do all the gardening, the planning of the gardening, mm -hmm. and Mother Scholastica does the preserving. It never stops the number of people at work. Yes, and which is a key to Benedictine life. Yes, it is. You know, that it's prayer and work, aura at labora. Mm -hmm. uh, that is very much the essence. I also told my dad, you know, my, my dad was a mechanic and a mm -hmm. truck driver and cab driver and stuff. She understood cars. I said, Dad, you know, when you look inside the engine of a car, the battery just sits there. But try to start the car without it. It's not so easy. <laughs> The, the cloistered religious are like the batteries of the car. They keep the juice going out to the moving parts. You know, and that's an important, important part well, of your ministry. certainly as I remember Mother Benedict, our foundress, she told me, you know, every day when I go into the office and I pray and I'm there, I ask the Lord, is this gift of prayer the one that's going to stop somebody from pushing a button? somewhere yes. that will be catastrophe. Yes. And I, I was stunned, but you know, I came to understand that there is an absolute fact that what we do, what, how we pray for one another, really makes a difference. Exactly. As a matter of fact, there's a tradition I've heard in uh, the Benedictine uh, background Benedictine writings and in among rabbis that there are just a few people who are so focused on God they are the ones who keep the whole world from falling apart mm -hmm. you know and and that, that's that's an important role that um, people th who think they're doing everything think they're the ones holding it together and Rabbis and spiritual tradition and Christianity both hold the same position. The holy people are the ones that keep it from falling apart. Mother Dolores, I'm afraid we've run out of time. But I really am grateful for you being here. I am too. And, and thank you for doing that book. Thank your sisters for the CD they did of Latin hymns. I use that when I pray the rosary. And I hope folks go over to Regina allowed us to get that. And let me give all of you a blessing. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
And, you know, we can bring you Mother Dolores and all the other programs that we have here, the various series and shows, and especially next week with our new news division being every day. And we just have to remind you that you bring this network to you. So keep us between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay our bills. Thank you.